Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. This is a call and response kind of stage on the main stage here at SOCAP 2018. My name is Ashara Ekundayo. I have the honor of being able to hold space with you and just steward a few of the conversations this morning and the next collective of, of thinkers and lovers that are coming out to spend a few minutes with you are very dear to me. I know that the conversation is framed around refugees, robots, and our dire need for regeneration. And this idea is that we're all in this together, and so that you've made a decision to be here with us, not as robots, but as living, breathing entities committed to the well-being of, of our collective harmony on this planet is part of what the next conversation is about. Dacher Keltner is a lover, author, professor, advisor, and director of the Berkeley Social Interaction Lab. He is also the faculty director of the Berkeley uh, Good Science Center at the University of California, Berkeley, as you all might imagined, uh, we have a lot of deep conversations and thinkers that share space and hold space for the, the next generation, this new now generation um, in academia. There's an installation out front. You all walked by it on your way into this building. And the question there is, what do you love and hope to never lose to climate change? And when I asked uh, Dacher what the, his answer to that was, he hopes to never lose the trees in the Sierras. And so I want to invite you all to stop and take a moment in reflection to think about that and to, to engage in that art installation that people have presented for us this morning. So he's going to be joining us on the stage. I ask you to uh, welcome him as he comes out to take a seat to sit with his colleagues, Mr. Dacher Keltner. Thank you. Yes, you all should welcome him. This sister I'm going to invite out, I met maybe mm, 13 years ago uh, in Denver, Colorado, when I was a fellow with an organization called Green For All, which was founded by this cat named Van Jones. You might have heard of him. And we were at the, the Bali conference, and this charismatic leader was there. And I was so excited to meet her. Her name is Michelle Long. Today, she is joining SOCAP as the co-founder of Jubilee, an investment platform for building beautiful portfolios that are catalytic in healing the earth, that are for equity and healing between people, and that build a ballast for the need to make these changes happen. She is full of so much joy, and she is a partner that I think um, is really setting the tone for and the ways in which we can collaborate our spiritual needs and well-being with our economic needs and well-being. Please welcome Michelle Long this morning. Daily Good, Smile Cards, and Karma Kitchen are only a few of the projects birthed from the mind and heart of this full-time volunteer. Napoon Mehta is the founder of Service Space, an incubator of projects that work at the intersection of the gift economy, technology, and volunteerism. This is a, a lover that I have been watching for many, many years, and I know you all might be thrown when you call someone a lover, but I'm, I'm really aware of our connection to each other and the bottom line being one that has to be uh, focused and sharing in a level of abundance around love and what we can and do and will and shall give to each other and gift to each other. So please welcome our brother Napoon Mehta here to the stage at SOCAP. And we allow them to, to just get, get ready and get into the juice of how we are going to move forward in this day and age. 
Blessings to you all. <laughs> Thank you. Working? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Oh, Hello. yes. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Well, it looks like we have a cozy little group. Um, this, does this sound okay? Is it a little loud? If someone could tur turn it down just a little bit, and now I'm talking and getting used to the microphone. I think somebody's working on it. Uh, so you guys are really lucky because we're having a sort of intimate uh, conversation with these two. Um, as Bo was just sharing with us all, uh, he has worked in investing and building companies for a long time, and now is at a place where he recognizes the biggest point of leverage is deepening into his own humanity and, cult and, and working with others to do the same. Um, and there's nobody better in the world to have this conversation to talk about how to do that, and if we actually can, than the two friends that I have here. Uh, these are two of my favorite people on the planet. Um, and I'd love to start with a question for Dakar. Um, we've been hearing some this week about uh, uh, companies who have said, th leaders of companies locally, some tech companies who've said things like, uh, why do I have to give anything back? I haven't taken anything. You know, a very individualistic kind of view of the world. And then I was talking to somebody recently who uh, was telling me about an interview that they did with uh, some indigenous leaders uh, uh, somewhere else on this planet. And uh, they were talking to this person about how do you guys save money like, or save for your future? And it was some back and forth, like, what do you mean saving? It, it finally, finally uh, there was an understanding. And uh, he said, well, I suppose that if I save, I save in the belly of my brother. Uh, I provide him meat today, and he provides me meat tomorrow. And so that fundamentally different worldview. And my question is, which are we? Are we competitive, really, by nature, or are we cooperative by nature? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, at UC Berkeley and then online with a bunch of um, uh, online classes through edX, I teach the science of happiness. And I know Bo talked about happiness. And, we worry a lot about, um, you know, frankly, the underperformance of the United States, how we've had a lot of expansive wealth and uh, haven't seen commensurate rises in happiness. And I think one of the fundamental reasons for that is what Michelle is talking about and what Nipun has devoted his career to, which is that when you take a step back and you look at our default basic nature, our default tendencies, what you find is, first of all, around the world, people will share about 40% of a resource. And this is in really rigorous studies. This is seen now in young kids, 18 months old, uh, that we, are, we have evolved to share. Uh, and you have to ask the question, to, do life context, do we share enough in that particular um, to, to sort of express that tendency? The second thing that's really important, and, and I think that this has not only happiness implications, but health implications, is there's a new... Uh, science the, of the neurophysiology of what it means to form community, to connect to other people, to share resources. And the very straightforward answers are when we share and when we give and when we form communities and support and cooperate, reward circuits in the brain are activated, the very same circuits that are mm -hmm. activated when we eat chocolate or win money or get a massage. Uh, those circuits then influence the stress response and activate parts of the nervous system I study. Uh, so what we find is this neurophysiology and behavioral data that says our, one of our basic instincts is to share and promote the welfare of others. And individualism and capitalism have, have misled us in, in that effort um, in many ways. I, I, love, I love so much Dacker because he, he is the sort of science that backs up what uh, many spiritual traditions tell us, what pockets of different cultures around the world tell us, that we, we, we are fundamentally good, we are fundamentally connected. And uh, he, he was the, one of the, I don't know if you're the first or the 
you're, you're, he's sort of the guy who, who the, a lot of, uh, for a long time, people uh, studied what makes us sad, what makes us depressed, but nobody was studying what makes us well, what makes us happy. Uh -huh. And uh, this is Dacker's specialty. What is fundamental well-being for all humans? What is our common humanity? And his research shows our common humanity is interconnectedness. It's a, a feeling of uh, compassion with each other, the feeling of empathy and connection with each other. When we feel awe and reverence as part of something that's bigger, we feel deeply well. And so yeah. I'm deeply grateful for you and your science. Um, and uh, I have a question for you, Nipun. It is, uh, okay, we got a lot of big challenges right now. I mean, big, scary, uh, grief-inducing challenges on this planet. Yeah. So how do we think about spending time on this kind of cultivating our hearts and inner work is, do we, do we have time for that? Don't we have to get on the big challenges? Yeah, I mean, you were talking about, first of all, I'm very happy to be here. Yes, Michelle yes, is yes. loved by both of us and Dacker. Usually I'm quoting Dacker, but now I'm sitting next to him, so I don't <laughs> yes, have to quote too. him. <laughs> um, but you were talking about indigenous cultures, and yes. I think one of the things, uh, you know, there's this seventh generation rule, like how is every decision going to affect, uh, you know, seven generations down the road? And what we've seen over time is just this sort of collapse of from seven generations to probably seven days to seven hours to seven minutes, maybe yeah. seven seconds, right? Our attention span is just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So what we're doing is looking for very quick, immediate feedback loops. And what that does is it binds us into direct <coughs> reciprocity. Direct reciprocity is transaction, right? I do this, you do this for me. And so how do we start to, and of course, if you're hungry or if you have an immediate need, there is a relief uh, that is required. But with the relief, you have to also uh, have on your solution spectrum a cure. And I think a lot of these cures are going to take a long time. Yeah. And we have to individually, like inner transformation isn't just going to happen overnight. Uh, but also a lot of these solutions externally, collectively, societally, are also going to take a long time because it actually took a long time to erode trust, for example. And it's going to take a long time to build it back up. And if we're just looking for short, quick, immediate yeah. feedback loops, or direct reciprocity. I gave you this, what am I getting in return right now? Versus I give you this, that's gonna create a ripple effect and over time, what goes around will come around, uh, which was sort of the basis of the indigenous wisdom. But how do we, how do we tap into that? Uh, and I think that's a mindset and that requires a huge shift. So yes, we have urgent fires, we have to address them, you have to provide relief, but that can't be the only thing we do. You have to couple that with these much larger expansive uh, in cycles of indirect reciprocity. Yeah. And I think that's not just a thing that we do on the outside, it requires an orientation on the inside to actually be able to hold such a large, uh, such a large field. I, it reminds me of uh, the, this woman, Lady Balfour. She was in um, England, and she was considered sort of the mother of this newest wave of organic food. And uh, a long time ago, she said, uh, the, uh, yes, sure, you could have a, like an organic label or you could have rules and regulations about what it should be, but really nothing beats the mindset of the farmer. Uh, it, it, if, the, if the farmer loves the land, they will continue to innovate. Um, and so more than anything, it is that mindset. And I know we've all spent time in Bhutan and met with the, uh, Dr. Karma Ura and the people who've created the GNH framework. And I was talking to a researcher from Australia who is studying gross national happiness uh, compared to corporate social responsibility, how what would be the difference? Well, if a company was to pursue yeah. a GNH approach rather than sort of a typical CSR approach, what would be different? And she said, well, first, the, the, the product would have to be fundamentally and in, inherently a value. You know, you wouldn't sort of have Coca-Cola with a diverse board of directors. It would actually be a product that we really need in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then two, uh, you'd have to look at how much is enough for the owners that created that company. How much is enough? And then you'd have to think, what would we do with the rest, any surplus that was created to benefit the most? But the key, she said, what is, is where are you inside? Because if, if, you, if you haven't done that sort of inner work, you may yeah. think, uh, how much is enough? Well, all of it is how much is enough. So it's all about the mindset. Do we see that we're part? And um, 
I, 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 we've been talking a lot about technology this week, and I'm wondering, I mean, are there, what, what's the, is technology a blessing or a curse to help us get to this mindset? I mean, some people are talking about virtual reality could help us to build empathy, and sometimes I think, well, why don't we just actually <laughs> talk to our neighbor, you know? But I, I wonder what you guys think about technology solutions around these ideas. Well, we've both thought a lot about it. I'm an engineer by trade, but uh, you, you were at Facebook uh, doing a lot of this work. Um, well, maybe your thoughts first? Yeah, um, I did a lot of uh, consulting at Facebook and Google, uh, just trying to make those spaces uh, to moderate success more compassionate. Um, and I know it elicits laughter these days, but um, <laughs> yeah, I think that, I think, um, I think we have, uh, I think technology, I think in terms of what it does to the human mind, I think a lot of the big patterns of data of what it means to be on screens, the average American is on a screen nine hours a day. I think it's, gonna, it's not the end of the world, it's not going to destroy the human mind, uh, but we haven't figured out how to kind of let it bring out the better side to human nature. And then I think that there are going to be um, ways in which it, it's going to solve critical problems, like how do you get um, people who are under-resourced to our national parks, 300 million people visit the national parks a year, technology will be a solution. And, and I really think where, and what I'm worried about in the current debates right now is uh, data actually has a lot of positive uses to it. Uh, data, the etymology of data is things that are given. And so if we can rethink how we can use our data, for example, for healthcare uses, I think there are going to be a lot of great innovations. Uh, but right now, I, I, I'm with Michelle. I think that um, I think our focus, if we're really interested in rebuilding community, which Nipun has been devoted to, and Michelle in heroic work, it's got to be face-to-face, uh, -face, and it's got to be these original systems of connection that mm. have to be promoted. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, you were the person that got Facebook to go from likes to like the whole range of emoticons, right? That took three years of that work. That's <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> hundreds of pages of writing. That's yeah. right. We're not just binary yeah. emotional people, right? We have multiple emotions. I know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think this is, you know, I, I'm a product of the Silicon Valley in so many ways. I was an engineer. Um, and initially, you had like the internet and oh my god, this peer-to-peer -peer system. And then yeah. all of a sudden now net neutrality is not even, you know, is in question. You had the search engines and now you see Google just you know, super dominating all aspects of our lives. I, before I even plan a trip to Italy, I've got AdWords saying, we'll learn Italian in nine <laughs> days. And they know that I'm leaving in nine days. So there's a lot of question marks around all of these social networks. Yeah. Initially, wow, you know, India and Pakistan can have friends across borders. Yeah. Um, then we realize, wow, this is like way too cheap, you know. Mm. And now with AI, we're having these yeah. issues. Yesterday, I was with uh, you know, the man who uh, was a CEO of Lycos, which sold for $17 billion and, uh, and has, you know, in a way, allowed Google to emerge. Um, and he was sharing this remarkable research. They asked young people, if you had to give up one of these three things, what would you give up? Your cell phone, your internet access, or your sense of taste? Wow. And 72% chose sense of taste. Uh. <gasps> oh. And for a lot of people, that kind of data is like, oh, this is a growth opportunity to go in that direction. But there's a huge yeah. question marks. Yeah. And if you think deeply about it, it's actually, initially, there, I had the same kind of response, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you think deeply about it, if you grow up in this kind of an era, what do you care more for than your sense of taste even is your sense of connection. Yeah. And the only connection that we have given exposure to systemically, societally, mm -hmm. to the young ones is through your phone and your internet access. That's all they know. Mm -hmm. So they, we long for this connection, but the kinds of connection, that, the kinds of designs we have created allow for very cheap, sort of loose, superficial connections, and those are good. I mean, there's still strength in loose yeah. ties, yeah. but that has to be coupled with the deep ties. And yeah. we as a society have not figured out how yeah. to leverage technology for some of this. Yeah. So how do we, you know, we have on one side the internet of life, and on the other side we have the internet of things. Both of those can coexist, and they do in many ways, but I think the question is what is leading what? Yeah. And if we keep the ratio of 
personal growth with technological growth in balance. Right now, it's completely out of whack. And if it's out of whack, we're, we're going to have the Internet of Things leading the Internet of Life. And then we're going to have things like, hey, I'm so stressed out by all this data. What should I do? Download yeah. a mindfulness app. Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to just putting this phone on the side. Right? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's sort of symptomatic of, of this world. But what does it take to have the Internet of Life lead the Internet of Things? And I think yeah. one very... Uh, key distinction that emerges from that uh, shift is that necessity, it used to be that necessity was the mother of invention. Now invention is the mother of necessity, right? <laughs> iPhone comes out with this new thing and I need, I need it because, <laughs> you know, because it's come out. Uh, and, and so this is a kind of skewed world that we're living in. Uh, and I think it starts to beg these questions of really the ratio of technical growth, engineering growth, uh, yeah. sort of innovation, and personal growth. And how do you keep those in balance? So, oh yeah, please. Yeah, but I just want, you know, one of the <coughs> things that, that I, I, I mean, I still am optimistic about big data. Um, I hope you all will pay attention to Raj Chetty at Harvard, the economist, just has this big data release of uh, how to think about neighborhoods. Nipun travels the world building strong neighborhoods. Uh, he is a, as has Michelle in their career. Here is technology producing data that's visualized where I think we now know as investors where to go if you want the biggest bang for your buck is to find particular streets on neighborhoods where we know through data and technology this is where we'll really make a difference, right? And this is where our money is wasted. So. I'm, I'm really optimistic yeah. about those kinds of uh, innovations to guide us. Yeah. So, thank you. So you, but you're saying that deep ties are the, what really makes us deeply well. It's really who we are. So, do you have, today we're living, Dacker, you mentioned the, we're out of whack of our fundamental nature of cooperation, yeah. in part due to this capitalistic structure that we're part of. Yeah. And uh, Charles Eisenstein, our, all of our friends, said, said uh, once something about it'd be impossible to talk about evolution of ourselves without also addressing money because it's so fundamental uh, to, to, uh, to us right now. We're sort of woven up with it. So how do we move from a transactional economy toward what's being called for a deeper longing? Do you have steps or ideas? Yeah. I, I definitely have ideas <laughs> um, and, and experiments. I mean, I, I yes, try to live talk into about them. Those. Um, I, the, one of the shifts we talk about in service space is a shift from transaction to trust. So, for example, Karma Kitchen is an experiment where you walk into a restaurant and your bill reads zero. Your check is zero because someone before you paid for you, and you are trusted to pay forward for people after you. And they studied it at UC Berkeley, and they said, yeah. would this work? Because this is so antithetical to the entire economics framework that we're fundamentally selfish, and we aim to maximize self-interest, yeah. uh, and, we're, and we're rational, right? And we're <laughs> neither one of those. Um, and so what does it mean to give people insight into these ideas? And I think the road from transaction to trust goes through relationships. Hmm. That Trust cannot actually be manufactured. It has to emerge in this field of multidimensional relationships. Transactional, transactions become very one-dimensional. I do this, you, you do this for me, right? right? How do you move from that to multidimensional relationships? Right? I'm not going to my mom and dad and saying, yeah. you've, Dad, you washed my car three times, and so I'm going to do this for you. It's, it's a multidimensional relationship. We are embedded. We are capable of that. And we're embedded in many of these multidimensional relationships. So how do we create those kinds of communities um, that allow for that? And I think in that kind of a field, we'll have amazing fruits of pro-social behavior, yeah. like uh, you know, so many of the things you have studied, yeah. compassion, awe, gratitude, uh, but also things like trust. And so I think we really have to learn to move into a more relational way of engaging. Uh, and, and that begs the question of who do I have to be to hold people and their journeys yeah. uh, in a, in a non-transactional way. <laughs> yeah, and I would, um, I would, I would really encourage uh, our audience members, if you haven't already, to read um, um, a book about social infrastructure by Eric Kleinenberg. Got his PhD at UC Berkeley, now at NYU. 
and he really feels that the central problem facing the United States in this social space is to create um, social places where we build the trust and the relationships mm. that gives rise to collaboration and cooperation and all these physiological processes that benefit, benefit us, Eric Kleinenberg. So for example, um, they're like the public library or the park or the pickup basketball court or the barber shop mm. are these old social contexts that aren't on our radar screen as places of innovation, yeah. but they turn out to be the foundation of human health, right? And so we want to start to sort of move from the mind to what are the facets of social communities that are healthy? When I travel in Mexico, which is, I think, my favorite country in the world, uh, I was born there, you go to a Zocalo in any town in Mexico, and it has so much deep wisdom and healthcare and innovation uh, that we're trying to use technology to recreate, and we should be thinking about the physical spaces that, that Nipun travels the world creating uh, that, that allow for these sides to human nature. Um, our mutual friend, uh, Otto Scharmer at MIT and the Presidency Institute, uh, talks about how we're coming to the end of an era of maximum me. Uh, quite obviously, the, the, we, we've, maximized, we've maxed that one out. And what's trying to be born is not so clear, but it is something that is about expanding our intellect from yeah. our head to our hearts, about the evolution from an ecosystem awareness that that sees the world from uh, how do I make decisions that benefit me to one that makes decisions from what benefits us, including me, from an ecosystem awareness to an ecosystem awareness. Do you have examples, either of you or both of you, hopefully, uh, around examples in business or in finance where people have actively aimed to cultivate that heart cogn cognition, the, the ability to see from we, mm -hmm. and then how did that manifest in a, a different kind of way of doing business mm -hmm. or with money? Yeah, what a, what a terrific question. Um, I, I love on this. I love Mike. Anybody read Michael Pollan's book, uh, How to Change Your Mind? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, yeah. And in the spirit of Nipun, he said the the uh, spirituality is the is the counterpoint to egotism and self interest. That if we want to find our spiritual connection to the world or the big we the big sense of self, it's moving away from narrow self interest, as Nipun has been arguing. Mm. I, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in um, our investment in green spaces. And there are, is a ton of incredible science. Uh, Japan and South Korea have led this. In South Korea, they treat forests as medical settings where you can heal physically. We know that it's good for the nervous system, uh, you know, and the immune system to be out in, in nature. We know public parks help inner city kids. Uh, and, and that is one of these things that we have invested modestly in, and it has these huge we benefits and health benefits and reductions in the, the, the uh, social ills that we worry about. Uh, and it's, again, it's something that seems intuitive but has, has a big uh, influence on in terms of getting good returns from our investment. Mm -hmm. um. I, yeah, I agree, and I actually think Dacker's work has been uh, a sign, a, a sort of ray of incredible hope. You know, nobody's compassion. Like, how do you design for compassion? Yeah. I mean, these are questions that people don't ask. You know, how do you design? What What is the role of gratitude in yes. my business? Um, yeah. What is awe? And <laughs> you know, what What is the neuroscience of goosebumps? We've all felt goosebumps, and there's zero science on it. And Dacker comes along and says, "Wait a second, you know." Uh, let's actually study this and incorporate a lot of this. So I think that's a big ray of hope, actually. Um, and at a, at a very practical level, I think I would say that what's inspired me most is uh, spaces and people who yeah. are in control of their minds, because I think that's fundamental. That's sort of the ground in which all these virtues arise. Um, so Birju, one of our common friends, <laughs> he had this incredible story of his boss saying he was on Wall Street uh, running this venture capital fund, and, uh, and his boss says, we've had a great year, what do you want? And these guys are like billing every three minutes, and he says, what I want is a minute of silence. And you know, his boss doesn't understand it, and then ultimately he kind of gives in, and he says, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, 
But that idea of learning how to honor that inner quiet uh, is really fundamental. And I think it is from that space that we start. And that minute turned to two minutes, to three minutes, to five minutes, to 30 minutes once a week. They've even got their own bell, you know, yeah. And, yeah. and so that's great, yeah. right? Like that kind of a thing, I think, is, it gives me a lot of hope. Um, and, and I think these are the kinds of solutions. We heard some of what Bo was talking about, yeah. exploring real freedom. You know, uh, I, think, <laughs> I think these are things that, uh, to me, seem like great experiments. And, and, and once you do that, then so many different things emerge. I, I've seen, I saw, um, I mean, there's so many examples in so many spaces. Um, I, I think in um, Louisville, the police force is being measured by their compassion. Is that yeah. right? In, in their arrests. Um, and um, you, you, there's so much more in schools for social and emotional learning. Yeah. And DACA, of course, is leading um, several, uh, Kaiser, Novartis, other yeah. healthcare companies on empathy with um, medical doctors. Uh, but in business and finance, you know, if, if we don't do it there, <laughs> uh, and, but I did, one example that I heard from an investor that I really loved was, uh, with investments he made, he would also place on top of those investments a generosity warrant. So he would give um, additional capital to the entrepreneur uh, uh, to cultivate who they were as leaders of the company. Yeah. So he wasn't only interested in the products they made, but who they were to meet a changing world. Will they meet it with compassion? Will they meet it with empathy? And these generosity warrants were meant to cultivate that yeah. kind of those qualities within their team. So uh, one company, for instance, got, received this generosity warrant, and uh, they didn't quite know what to do with it, but they decided to take some of this money and try little experiments, like buying a meal for somebody at the next table at the restaurant, and, you know, as a group of <laughs> uh, people at this company, and not quite knowing, well, okay, we just did it, uh, let's record what happens. And they found how much better they felt, how much lighter they felt, how much more free they felt. And eventually, from those kinds of experiments, they, uh, they, they recognized that they were a manufacturing company, that the guys on the floor didn't have health care benefits. They had health care benefits, car allowances, cell phone allowances, and on and on and on. They decided to cut some of their own allowances and get health care for the factory floor. Mm. And, uh, and they felt good. But then fascinating, uh, there was a big storm, a hurricane that came, and mm -hmm. um, this factory was sort of put out of business. But they were the first ones back up. They were the first ones back up because everybody that was there felt a part of the company and felt um, this was their company. And so it actually ended up being successful for the company, even though it was actually about their mm. own um, evolution to tenderness with each other. Mm. Um, yep. So we only have a minute left, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so um, my work with uh, at, at Jubilee Partners with partners uh, Don Schaefer and Dave Haynes, Connor Mason, Jed Emerson, uh, Marion Moore, uh, we are in interested in investing in the spiritual ballast, the ballast yeah. for our soul um, going forward in this changing world so that we can stay human. Any big acupuncture points, any leverage points, where would you invest for that future? We have 30 seconds. Dacker, take it away. Uh, well, I think the central problem, uh, one of the two central problems in the United States is inequality, and so I would think about investing in ways that, you know, lift up, and, and we now have the data to do that, and to do it assertively. Cool. I got 15 seconds. I would say that we ultimately design who we are, so we really nice. got to start looking inside, um, yeah. and I think we need to start to think about capital from just... Uh, financial wealth to multiple forms of wealth. Yeah. We need to start to think about motivation from just extrinsic motivation to really intrinsic motivation. I think yeah. if we do that and we design who we are, we'll create new patterns. And we'll be happier, as Dacker's found. <laughs> and so this is a path to not only uh, solving complex crises, the ability to see from we, not only me, but the path to our joy. Yeah. And we have a lot of joy, so... We've yeah. got it, man. Join us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank you. you guys. Okay.